It's great to be here to talk about Whitney to an audience that is more familiar with her sculpture than I think uh, my typical audience is. Uh, when I tell people that we're doing this show here at the Norton, at the Norton Museum in West Palm Beach, uh, they always look at me kind of quizzically and say, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, the founder of the Whitney Museum, she did sculpture. Um, so it's a surprise for people. And I think that's because this has actually not been done since her lifetime. She died in 1942, and there hasn't been a show of her work since then. So I think it's about time to look at her art and uh, consider, um, consider it in a serious way. Uh, I'm, sh I'm showing you here a, a picture you've seen, actually, uh, this is the third time you've seen it today. Uh, this is Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney with her uh, Buffalo Bill that you have here in Cody. And uh, I wanted to show it to you first to remind you why I'm here, uh, the connection to Cody. But I'm not going to dwell on that sculpture today because Karen has already introduced it to you and spoken about the connection between Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney and Cody and this sculpture in particular. So what I'm going to do instead is give you kind of a broader context of her career, and I hope that will help you put your sculpture in context. Okay. So I wanted to start with the kind of better known, I think, uh, version of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, which is the Whitney Museum. Um, here on the left you see her uh, the Whitney Studio Club that she founded in 1907. And this, these are the galleries from the Whitney Studio Club. These became uh, key places for contemporary American artists to show their work. And she was a, a major patron of contemporary American artists in her time. Uh, she also bought their work in great numbers. So uh, on the right, I'm showing you the, that institution as it's now morphed into the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Uh, her collection, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's collection of historical American, of the, let's see, early, earlier 20th century American art is still the backbone of that historical collection there. But as you all know, she was also a sculptor. So I'm showing you here two images of her sculpting and with her sculpture. On the left is a, an image from her catalog from 19, her 1919 exhibition called Impressions of the War. So here you see her doing uh, some of her sculpture that was inspired by her experience of World War I. And on the right, her with some of her uh, sculptures that she did uh, for her 1936 exhibition at the Nerdler Gallery in New York. Uh, it's interesting to think about Whitney in comparison to a lot of other artists because she was uh, different from a lot of artists in the sense that she was vastly wealthy. She was born into the Vanderbilt family in New York, and by the time she was born into it, uh, her family had made a massive fortune in shipping and railroads. So she did not need to do this work, strictly speaking, to put money, to put uh, food on the table. Uh, she did not need a profession. In fact, she was really kind of raised to be a society hostess uh, and a mother, uh, but she was not raised to have a profession. But as we'll talk about today, she, she, uh, needed sculpture because she found in it kind of a purpose for her life. Also, it was a way for her to express herself. Uh, it gave her a kind of outlet for personal expression that she didn't, didn't have in any other way in her life. Uh, she had kind of an, a repressive upbringing that discouraged personal expression. So sculpture became very important to her for that reason as well. I think uh, it's important to consider her as an artist in part because she became this great patron of artists, of other artists, in part because of her experience as an artist herself. She knew how hard it was to be an artist, and she, for that reason, was a great supporter of other artists, bought their work, gave them money to go abroad. And so her work is important for that reason, but also because, for its own sake, I think. And if you just have to look around Cody to realize this, uh, her Buffalo Bill is everywhere. Uh, since I've gotten here. When I got off the plane yesterday, it was right there. Um, so you see how the power of public sculpture, and this is why I think it is important to look at her, at her art for its own sake. So starting you off with a portrait of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney at the age of 13 by the British artist John Everett Millay. Uh, so as I said, she was born into great wealth. Uh, she was raised in, in kind of with a great 
a life of privilege. Uh, but despite this, she was, from the earliest stages of her life, dissatisfied with it. And we know this because she was a great writer. And I must say, as a historian, it's uh, wonderful to work on Whitney because, uh, because she wrote so much. We have such a great sense of what she did and how she felt about it. Uh, so she, did, she wrote journals throughout her life. Uh, she wrote a lot of fiction, actually, much of which is kind of thinly veiled autobiographical uh, fiction. And she wrote uh, letters to people that she never sent that were very revealing of how she felt. So we have a good sense of how she felt about herself and her life. As uh, early on, she wrote about how she was dissatisfied with the fact that she was a girl. She didn't have the opportunities that her brothers had uh, to go to college and to pursue uh, professions. Also, she was frustrated by the fact that her great wealth meant she felt that she couldn't have an actual authentic uh, relationship with anyone because they would always be judging her through the lens of her wealth. So these are, she was not the happiest child growing up. Then in uh, 1896, she married uh, Harry Payne Whitney, and I'm showing you here her bust of him from uh, 10 years later, 1906. Uh, Harry Payne Whitney was an eminently suitable match for her. Uh, he came from a uh, family was, that was almost as wealthy as hers and that was equally well thought of in the kind of upper class New York society. Nevertheless, uh, his, her marriage to him did not bring her the happiness she hoped it, it had, it would. Um, she pretty quickly had two children and she loved her children. We know this from, again, what she wrote. But uh, she disliked the fact that having the children took her away from the travel and other activities that she very much enjoyed. So uh, it's important to note here, maybe an obvious point, but at this point, women, even women of her class, uh, very, very wealthy, were much more involved in the raising of their children than the men were. So it was, it was a, a major kind of drain on her time uh, to, to be a mother. Also, um, Pretty quickly upon getting married, she realized that this kind of life of the society hostess that she had been raised to perform was not going to satisfy her. At the same time, her husband uh, began to spend more and more time with his father in their kind of shared pursuits of polo and horseback riding. Uh, he was kind of, he let go of his kind of dreams of becoming a lawyer, and he kind of withdrew into the kind of leisure pursuits of their class. At the same time, she was thinking she wanted to get out of the leisure pursuits of their class. So there was a kind of real, uh, pretty quickly, a, a pretty uh, significant gap between the two of them, and she felt this kind of emotional distance. In fact, she wrote, and this I'm quoting here from her journals. Uh, this is one that she called Beginning of Autobiography, written later in 1912. But she wrote, I wanted to work. This is so about that time in, uh, at the very end of the 19th century. She wrote, I wanted to work. I was not very happy or satisfied in my life. I found myself looking into a future that held neither pleasure nor satisfaction. I had always drawn and painted a little. Now I wanted to try modeling. So by the year 1900, she had decided she wanted to be a professional sculptor. And she studied first with uh, sculptor Henrik Christian Anderson, and I'm showing you uh, one of Anderson's works here called Pater Familius. As you can see, he worked in a kind of uh, neoclassical style inspired by ancient Greek, Greece and Rome, and he taught his pupil to work in that same style. So uh, he encouraged her to do uh, anatomical drawings, to learn how the human body moves in space. And you can see that, I think, particularly here on the left in a drawing like this in which she's drawing not only the person's skin, but also the muscles and the tendons beneath that skin that, that allow the person to move. You can see how that kind of interest in human anatomy translates then into her early sculptures, such as this uh, one on the right, which is from 1906, called Athlete. Again, it's all about the kind of human body moving in space. And her first major large-scale sculpture was called Aspiration. I'm showing you it here. And you can see how it also is in this neoclassical mode. This is from 1901. And it was chosen for inclusion at the Panama 
excuse me, not that, that's that right, at the, um, uh, now the, the name is, the exhibition in Buffalo in 1901. And uh, it was actually shown in front of the New York building. And so you can see that that is where you're seeing it here, no longer extant, unfortunately. So as she continued to sculpt then, she became uh, drawn to the work of the French master Auguste Rodin. Um, as I've described, I think for uh, Whitney, she uh, was really seeking a way to kind of express herself. Uh, she did not have that or was not raised to express herself uh, freely uh, by her parents and by the class she was raised in. So uh, she, I think Rodin's work drew her because it was so expressive. Um, so I'm showing you just an example of his work here on the left called Denied from 1885. Then, um, so she was drawn to Rodin's work. He actually came to her Paris studio in 1911, and there he critiqued her work, and he made these two figures here on the right for her. Um, these are now in the Metropolitan Mu Museum's collection. On the left, these are meant to illustrate principles of contrapposto to Whitney. Uh, on the left is Contrapasto according to the Renaissance, according to Michelangelo, and on the right is Contrapasto according to the ancient Greeks, or Phidias, according to Rodin. So then, at this time, uh, Whitney begins to do a lot of works that are very influenced by Rodin, and I'm showing you here on the right this, her sculpture, Wherefore, first modeled in 1907, and this is the cast here at the Whitney Western Art Museum. Um, so you can see, I think, clearly the connection between um, the Rodin work here and the Whitney work. Uh, all of these works that are very influenced by Rodin have a, a, a kind of mound of earth and a, a human being kind of a, a arrayed over it in different positions. So she's kind of experimenting with that really in the last years of the, um, of the 1900s, like that, that first decade. And here she begins to write about how her sculpture is giving her a way to express herself. Again, from this beginning of autobiography journal from 1912. She writes, I used to be very scared of my emotions. I used to hide behind a curtain and preserve a discreet silence. By force of expressing myself in my work, my shyness has become much less embarrassing. So at the same time that she's becoming a serious sculptor in the, that first decade of the uh, 20th century, she is beginning to collect and support the American realists uh, painters um, that are usually referred to as the Ashcan school, if you know that term, or the, the eight sometimes too. Um, I'm showing you just two examples of their work here. On the left, uh, Robert Henry's The Laughing Child. This is, was actually owned by Whitney and is now in the Whitney Museum's collection. And on the right, George Bellows' Cliff Dwellers, which, um, here, I think you can see two sides of the Ashcan School's work. One is on, with the Henry on the left. You see the, the way that they took working class subjects and, and elevated them to be the subjects of art. And this was, uh, it's hard for us to see, I think, now in the early 20th century, I mean, the early 21st century, but at that time, this was a very radical thing to do in the American art world. Uh, impressionism ruled the day at this time. So this was, it was a kind of very gritty subject matter for. Americans, and especially works like Bellows's work on the right, which um, uh, many of these works kind of expose the uncomfortable, disagreeable working conditions and living conditions for the working classes in the new urban areas that were growing up at this time. Um, so that's why, that's why cliff dwellers would have kind of made people very uncomfortable at this time. So when these painters were uh, rejected from the National Academy of Design's annual exhibition in 1908, they showed their work separately in an exhibition that they called The Eight at the Macbeth Galleries. And uh, I think uh, Whitney uh, was particularly drawn to them because she was herself anti-convention. And that's because she felt that convention, it was convention that had kind of trapped her or attempted to trap her in an unfulfilling life. So she's trying to fight against that convention throughout her life, really. And so this is why I think the realists were particularly attractive to her. And so indeed, at the same time, she begins to uh, support the realists, to uh, buy their work, to support them by giving them exhibitions, but also she begins to do realist work herself. And I'm showing you here on the right, 
uh, her head of a Spanish peasant um, from 1911. I should say also that we are kind of midway through this project, so you'll see that sometimes we have beautiful photography of these objects, and sometimes you're seeing the picture taken with my cell phone, so <laughs> apologies for that. Um, but um, I think you still get a sense of the, here in this work, she's really very focused on the exact details of this man's face. In fact, he was her studio assistant, Adolf Ramon. And she wants to give you every detail of his face in order to convey his personality. Um, I should say also that this is uh, the plaster of the work. Um, I think we know that Whitney worked in clay. Uh, a, for her, uh, she, she, she would model the work in clay, and she, uh, which was not a permanent medium. So then she then worked with professional workers in plaster and then professional casters in bronze and, uh, or marble carvers, stone carvers, in order to create the finished product. So this is not unusual at this time, but it's something to remember, is that she does, she's not making the works, the actual works that I'm showing you today, except for the drawings, and that's why I think the drawings are so important. Um, but the plaster is in a way kind of part of that, uh, part of that um, way of making these works. And so I think in our show, I wanna show some of the plasters because I think that will make this kind of relatively esoteric uh, method of making objects that's, that's hard for a modern art audience to understand, more understandable for them. I should say also that the, her head of a Spanish peasant, the work on the right, was uh, bought, a, a cast of it was bought by the um, avant-garde critic A. E. Gallatin in 1917. And Gallatin also bought the works of the Ashcan School. So he w really was making these, people at the time were making the connection between her work in sculpture, realist work, and the Ashcan School's work in painting. She uses this kind of realism, really, uh, for particular kinds of sculpture. Uh, particularly for her portraits of her family. So I'm showing you here and friends as well. Uh, but here, these are family members. On the left, her portrait of her daughter, Barbara, and on the right, her daughter, Flora. Um, this is Barbara from 1913 at age 10. Um, she subtitled the, the work, Barbara the Wallflower. Um, and I think you can see how uh, Barbara's pose here with her hands in her pockets, kind of leaning back, uh, kind of closed off to the world. She has a kind of prepubescent awkwardness that ca might characterize a 10-year-old. Um, and, and again, this kind of uh, careful realism that she's using in these types of work is intended to convey that underlying personality of the, the sitter. Then on the right, a more tragic uh, story, uh, this is her daughter Flora after her daughter Flora's fiance died in World War I. And so she's mourning here, and I think you can really see that by, by her pose and the way, the way that Whitney has chosen to, to model her daughter here. At the same time, though, she's beginning to get major uh, public commissions, and she uses a very different style when she's working on those commissions, um, because I think she felt that the kind of realism uh, was uh, too specific for a kind of uh, more public, uh, general audience. And so she uses kind of more symbolic, uh, allegorical, and or even classical types of sculpture for, or styles for those commissions. Here, I'm showing you her first major commission, which was for the, uh, Arlington, the fountain at the new Arlington Hotel in Washington, DC. And so here on the left, again, one, of, one for my cell phone, um, this is a, uh, the plaster of this uh, her model, so a small plaster model for the uh, final commission. And I love this work in particular because you can see the, the marks of Whitney's fingers in that plaster, even though, of course, her fingers would have been in the, in the clay. Still, you can see the, her hand there. Then you see her on the right standing with a kind of the large-scale final version of one of these figures. Now, in fact, unfortunately, as often happened to public uh, sculptors, um, the financing for the Arlington Hotel fell through, so the final fountain was never uh, installed in Washington. But in 1931, Whitney 
gave a marble version of the fountain to McGill University in Montreal. So I'm showing you that here on the left. So if you want to see it in person, that's where you go. Excuse me for a moment. Then in 1915, she received an uh, important commission to do uh, a uh, monument to, or kind of a memorial to those who had died in the uh, sinking of the Titanic. Also, this was intended for Washington, D.C. I'm showing you here on the left her uh, model for the work, kind of smaller uh, model, and on the right, the final version. Um, so it's interesting to Carol's point earlier, um, you can see that they are very similar, these two compositions, but slightly different. And one difference is the fact that the male anatomy in the left is very obvious. On the right, it's been covered up. And that is because she's responding to um, the kind of dismay of the people who had commissioned the sculpture. Um, so this tells you a little bit about the continuing conservativeness of the American art world, even in 1915. You might wonder also, why is there a bronze version of her maquette for the sculpture? This is not supposed to be the final design. In fact, what she often did was made these kind of bronze versions in order to be able to then show that version in exhibitions. She realized that in order to be a kind of successful professional sculptor, she not only needed to be able to get these kind of major public commissions, but she also needed to be able to show her work uh, in exhibitions throughout the world, and that's what she did, in fact. So you see her doing this again and again, making other versions of her public sculptures in order to be able to show them in exhibitions. In fact, that is why we can do the exhibition today, because otherwise, so many of her works are still out in the world, it's impossible to do an exhibition. I want to say also about this composition that I think it's particularly appropriate for a Titanic memorial, because to me, it reminds me of two things. One, um, a ship's figurehead, which is appropriate again for a ship going down, but then also it is a, in a cross-like figure. So again, about this kind of sac uh, needless human sacrifice that occurred with the sinking of that ship. So this is uh, uh, Robert Henry's portrait of Gertrude Venable Whitney from 1916, right at the time when she's really beginning to make it as a sculptor. Uh, this was the year that she had her first solo show, and she went on to have solo shows throughout the US and in Europe. Uh, I love the way Henry paints her because you really get a sense of her unconventionality here. Uh, she is kind of very relaxed, casual, lying on a sofa, uh, wearing pants. Uh, it's, it's not a typical kind of high style portrait of the time. And so it really kind of conveys, I think, her daring here to you. It's interesting to compare it with her only sculpted self-portrait, which I'm showing you here on the right. It's called Chinoise. Um, now, uh, Whitney had gone to the Far East, to China and Japan, um, on her honeymoon, actually. She'd been fascinated with kind of East Asian mysticism ever since then. But this is really the only instance of it entering her sculpture. Uh, so you can see how she's sculpting herself here really as a bodhisattva. Uh, so she's got the kind of flowing robes, typical uh, 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 depiction of a bodhisattva. She's standing on a lotus. Uh, she has her hands in these kind of traditional sacred mudras that um, have particular meaning in the Buddhist faith. It's an interesting depiction of yourself, obviously. Um, I think for her, it shows her in this kind of moment of serenity. And to me, it's kind of a aspirational type of sculpture as opposed to uh, reflecting the reality of her life. Because in fact, like many women artists of this time, uh, she was really juggling a lot of personal responsibilities with her career. And that's the sense in which, even though she had this great wealth and she did not have to, as I said, work to put money on the table, she had many people helping her with the kind of everyday chores of life. But she still had, she had many responsibilities to her children and also to her uh, social class. And so uh, she was always trying to juggle those, those responsibilities with the work that she wanted to do. And that's a sense that you, you see that, I think, in the work of women artists, especially at this time, more than, than the male artists. Um, as I said, she was much more involved in the raising of her children than her husband was. And I think a poignant example of this 
is here um, on the left. This is uh, embedded in one of her uh, scrapbooks, or sorry, excuse me, sketchbooks. In amidst those anatomical drawings are these children's drawings. And you can see how this might happen to a mother who is also an artist, where the child would suddenly draw things, or she might be encouraged to draw in the, in the uh, sketchbook, uh, alongside her mother's very serious anatomical sketches. So then in 1914, World War I broke out. And Whitney, um, I should say, had, she had a, a studio in New York. She had a studio in Long Island. She had a studio in Newport, Rhode Island. And she also had one in Paris. And so she spent a great deal of time in Paris. And she really grew to love the French culture. So when World War I broke out, she was uh, very dismayed. And she really felt that she wanted to do something to help in the war effort. You all remember that uh, the United States didn't enter the war until 1917. But Whitney wanted to immediately become involved. And so she went to France, and she volunteered as a nurse. And I'm showing you here on the, her, the left her nurse's uniform. Um, while she was, she was spent a number of months there, she ended up founding a hospital in France um, as well. And while she was there, she made a number of sketches of people she saw on the front, sort of the life on the, life on the front. I'm showing you here one on the right. Then when she returned to the United States, she began to kind of create, uh, make these kind of sketches in sculpture. Uh, so she's making them in clay, and I think she's really thinking about these as sketches in a way. They're not really meant for, they're not meant as a public monument or anything at, at this point. Um, if, I don't know if any of you have seen any of these works, but they're, they're pretty small, they're about this big. And in fact, you can see them, her standing with them on the left, working on them. Um, I, I wanted to include this one called Sighted on the right because you can see it in the background on the left. This is her uh, uh, soldier from a colored regiment on the left and uh, his last charge on the right. And these bring up, I think, uh, separately, these are maybe less impressive, but as a group, they really kind of embody that life on the front and it, in a kind of more realistic and less glamorized way than uh, many other depictions I've seen. Uh, many uh, American sculptors, or an American artist at the time, um, memorialized World War I in a kind of glamorous way and, and made it seem like a kind of, kind of emphasized the victorious aspects of it. Now, Whitney was really the only American artist who actually had experienced life on the front. We also know, as I've said, that she was uh, dedicated to realism in many ways. And so I think for her, it was she wanted to use realism to really depict the way life actually was on the front, which was filled with death, really. So you see here on the right, this his last charge is a soldier charging to his death. And you see this kind of more realistic, kind of grim version of the war uh, appearing in uh, her, the first kind of public monuments that she does after the war. Um, she participated in a kind of group effort that was in Madison Square in New York uh, of, uh, there was a memorial arch to World War I, and she, this uh, memorial arch was made out of staff that other people have discussed today. So it was not intended originally to be uh, permanent, and the uh, gentleman who organized it organized the effort of making it, really wanted to make it permanent, but he never got the funding to do so. However, Whitney, this is often true with her, had enough money to actually cast her works in bronze, and that's why we still have them today. So I'm showing you two of them here. She made three plaques for, the, for this victory arch. Um, and I think what you see here, if you look at these carefully, you can actually find her different, those different like sculpted sketches, or. Um, that I was showing you earlier. You can find different examples of them w within these compositions. But I think the overall effect is of a kind of chaos. You see figures going in all directions here. It's not, again, about kind of victory or glamour or uh, heroism. It's about the kind of chaos of war. Here is her uh, monument at uh, Washington Heights in New York, 168th Street and Broadway. And I'm showing you on the left Again, the kind of maquette that she could then, the kind of, uh, let's see, bronze version of her maquette that she could then show in a exhibition. And then on the right, the final version in Washington Heights. 
Here you have a kneeling soldier and a standing soldier supporting a soldier that's, that's slumping over. And again, this is very unusual in American art at the time to see a wounded soldier, because it's again kind of emphasizing the negative aspects of the war here. Here you see her on the left standing, looking up at the, at the kind of maquette, the uh, permanent version of the maquette uh, um, in her 1923 exhibition at the Wildenstein Galleries. Then in uh, 1924, she was commissioned to make a monument in Saint-Nazaire, France, uh, of, uh, to kind of memorialize the place that the Amer American troops had first landed in France in, at the, it, during World War I. And so I'm showing you here at the upper left a very early sketch for her conception for the monument. Um, you can see how it's very gestural, but even at this early stage, she had a sense of it being a kind of um, figure on a plinth with wings. Um, the final, she's standing with the final kind of plaster here, uh, um, lower left. And you, so here you can see that uh, the effect of this is a cross. Uh, you have the American soldier wearing his very characteristic kind of doughboy attire here, holding a sword and standing on the back of an eagle. The effect of all of these uh, elements put together is a cross, as I said, because the kind of wings of the eagle and the, the, the doughboy make one cross. There's also then uh, the cross of his sword. And uh, these, so the, these, the two things are kind of echoing each other in the composition. I think that kind of uh, cross was, a, was appropriate for, for her because it kind of emphasizes the fact that the uh, Americans came to save France um, in this conception and that they, had, they brought France their salvation in a way. So uh, it's a much more positive view of the war than you got in her earlier war sculptures, but I think that's because it was a, for a specific, meant to memorialize a specific moment in the war that was a positive one. I should say also that when the Germans invaded France in World War II, they did not like this sculpture because they reminded them of the previous war and their defeat in it, so they tore it down. Uh, but it has since been reconstructed, so I'm showing you the reconstructed version here. Um, so it's Whitney's war sculpture, her war memorials, that really make her into a kind of internationally known public sculptor. And that's when she begins to get other commissions of non-war related works like Buffalo Bill here in Cody. Also on the right, this is her uh, monument to Christopher Columbus, which is in Huelva, Spain. And she did this between 1928 and 1933. So at the point at which she designed the Huelva monument, um, Whitney had just visited Egypt for the first time. So I'm showing you here on the left uh, the colossal figures of Ramses uh, from the temple at Luxor. Uh, Whitney was fascinated by the kind of abstraction and kind of uh, emphasis on geometry that she saw in these, in these sculptures in Egypt. So she kind of translates that into her design for the Huelva monument. This is a much more abstracted design than she had ever done before. She's influenced in this also, though, by the rise of Art Deco, which we've also ta already talked about today. Uh, Art Deco was really taking the world by storm, and particularly in New York. I'm showing you a uh, building facade from Lexington Avenue in Manhattan in her native New York on the left. So you can see how this kind of, that same kind of emphasis on abstraction, uh, geometry, stylization, um, was appearing in sculpture th around her. And so it, it creeps into her work as well. This is her uh, sculpture that she did for the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Uh, the best image I have of it, unfortunately. Which, so it's her with her studio assistant um, as they work on the design for this. Uh, it was called Spirit of Flight. Unfortunately, we don't have, I, don't, I haven't found a, an image of the final version. There is no sculpted version of the final version, as far as I know. If you have one, please let me know. Uh, but. Uh, and that is unfortunate because uh, this it's very unusual for Whitney in the sense that I think because of the subject matter, because it was about flight, this kind of very modern uh, method of travel, she uh, decided to coat the sculpture, final sculpture in platinum to make it 
uh, kind of give it that kind of silver sheen, that kind of mechanized look that often appears in Art Deco sculpture as well. She also worked, she had a particular vision of a kind of base that she wanted for it, a kind of rainbow base. So she worked with the inventor and engineer Buckminster Fuller to design a, a base for it, and he suggested using the new technology of neon for uh, the base for this sculpture. So boy, would it be great to have an image of this, but I don't <laughs> as of yet. Uh, nevertheless, despite these kind of forays into more avant-garde design, I would say basically Whitney's continued to have the same kind of uh, dedication to representational and realism that she had had throughout her career. These are two sculptures that she showed in her last, what became her last solo show at the Nerdler exhibition, at the Nerdler Gallery in New York in 1936. On the left, um, it's called The Kiss, uh, very much indebted to Rodin, and she had first done a version of this uh, uh, composition when she was in that kind of Rodin influence period. And on the right, a uh, portrait of John. We don't know who he is, but possibly a servant in one of the Whitney estates. Uh, again, a very sensitive portrait, I think, in the sense that she's uh, showing you every single uh, vein, every single wrinkle on his face, and that gives you a real sense of his personality, of his kind of inner being. So, as I said, the, uh, the Nerdler exhibition where you, that you see here on the right, where those two sculptures were shown, uh, ended up being her last show. She died in 1942. Um, but I want to say, as a way of kind of summing up, that I think if you think about Whitney, you do have to, uh, as a sculptor, you have to address the issue of her money. How did, how did that affect her uh, work as a sculptor? It did help her in many ways. Uh, we know that because of her money, she could afford, as I said, to cast many of these kind of temporary designs in bronze, and that's why we still have them today. Uh, she also, her connections brought her many commissions, uh, but she also, it's important to say, did win commissions that were blind, so people didn't know who she was. So, um, so it did help her in that sense. At the same time, though, it hurt her, and that's because people assume, because she's a very wealthy woman, she could only be a dilettante. She can't possibly uh, be a serious professional sculptor. And I would say that is still true of her today. Um, that's why this hasn't been done since she died in 1942. People can't believe that the person who founded the Whitney Museum could also be a serious sculptor. But it, during her lifetime, she really did succeed in kind of redefining herself as a sculptor. Since her death, though, I think the progression of art history has been that the first historians of 20th century art were most interested in, in how it progressed toward abstraction. And so in that kind of history, there's no room for Whitney, really. Nowadays, I think we realize that the history of 20th century art is much more complicated than that, much more interesting than that. And so, so that's why I think it's now time to really look at her work anew. And I want to just end by inviting you to see our exhibition. Um, it will be at the Norton next winter. I can promise you better weather than anywhere you live. Um, and then in the summer in, uh, in um, Oyster Bay, New York, uh, on Long Island. And then the following year at the Newport Art, Art Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. You may travel to some other locations as well. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you.